discussion with some of my friends and some of my students over the last few months, uh, I've made mention of the liquidity trap as, as it was laid out by Keynes and, and tried to explain why even though recently the Federal Reserve has increased the money supply with a quantitative, quantitative easing, uh, we, we have not seen any benefit to the economy particularly, that is no real stimulus. We normally think that when the, when the Fed increases the money supply or the growth rate of the money supply, it will bring down interest rates and lower interest rates will induce people and businesses to borrow more and spend more. But in a liquidity trap, that doesn't happen. And when I, when I try to explain that, sometimes I, I feel like I'm not really getting across completely. So I'm going to spend a, just a minute with you here. What is a liquidity trap and what does it mean in terms of economic policy? So to, to do this, we're going to look at money in the United States and, and we're going to make a simple division. You either take your wealth and you hold it as cash, money, or you hold it as bonds, some sort of investment. Okay, bonds is going to help illustrate this. Why would you hold bonds? Because interest rates are high and you're earning a high rate of interest. Okay, what happens though when the Fed increases the money supply? Do you remember that from our discussions about monetary policy? If the money supply goes up, what happens to interest rates? They go down. Now, if you're holding bonds, and interest rates fall. Remember bond prices and interest rates? Well, that's neat. Your bond values go up when interest rates fall. But let's look at the economy. Here's my little graph, okay? This is the demand for money. It's a negatively sloped demand curve like we've always seen, the demand for cash. And what the reasoning is here is that when interest rates that are paid by bonds, interest rates in the economy generally, when interest rates are low, people hold more cash, more money. So when the Fed has the money supply at a given level, let's say money supply number one, that equates to a given interest rate in the economy, interest rate one, and when the Fed increases the money supply, an increase in the supply of money, MS2, this results in a drop in interest rates to interest rate level number two. And as interest rates drop from the increase in the money supply, hopefully, especially in a healthy economy, lower interest rates induce more borrowing and more spending, and the economy keeps pumping up. And if the economy slows down, arguably, the Fed can increase the money supply again. Let's do this out here to MS3. And so now they've driven the interest rate down to a very low level. Let's call that level... 3%, a very low interest rate. But then let's ask, what kind of interest rate is that after inflation? You remember that, the Fisher equation and real interest rates? The real rate, the real interest rate is the market rate, this 3%, minus the rate of inflation. So if this is 3%, but inflation is 2%, then you've got a 1% real interest rate. You tracking with me on that? And what if, in fact, the market rate were 3% and the inflation rate were 3%? You know, a zero real interest rate. And it can get worse than that. If inflation goes to 4%, but the market's only paying 3 you could have a negative real interest rate. And today, in sh on short-term American bonds, uh, government bonds, you're seeing negative real interest rates. Now think about that. Once you've div driven interest rates down, you, the Fed, to virtually a zero level, if you continue to increase the money supply, what happens to the interest rate? It can't go negative. Okay. And as a result, since you can't drive interest rates down any further, you can't stimulate the economy. You can't really have much impact uh, trying to induce people and businesses to borrow and spend more money. Now, you may recall, this is one of Keynes' criticism, that in a recession or a depression, when the Fed has done all that it can 
to reduce rates and stimulate the economy, they hit what he calls the liquidity trap, where everybody's holding money, nobody wants to hold bonds because they pay such a low rate, and that, in fact, a negative real rate. And so in the liquidity trap, the demand curve for money, we draw it horizontal, might be there, if you want to, you can draw it down here on the axis. In this range, over in here, this is your liquidity trap. And monetary policy doesn't do any good. All right so far? And until the economy recovers and you start seeing some increase in aggregate demand, you can keep pumping the money supply up. And while it won't do any good to stimulate the economy, by the way, neither is it going to cause inflation. And this is absolutely contrary to some of the classical arguments being made today that say, well, when you keep increasing the money supply, uh, you can't do that. It'll cause inflation. Not when you're in a liquidity trap. And until we get out of this liquidity trap, until the economy begins to recover, inflation is not a very urgent worry today. Instead, we are left with the debate and argument about how much debt can we handle and should we stimulate the economy? Do we want to approach things with an austerity look? Let's don't go further into debt. Or do we want to approach the economy with a stimulus view? We need to get out of this mess. I'll make the point on, on another discussion, but think about this. If you decide we want to stimulate the economy, you the government, and you can go out and borrow money for zero interest, zero real rate, does that make stimulus a little more attractive? Yes, you'll go further into debt, but your interest rate is still low. 